Thanks, Mike. How many of you have been following what's going on in the news in the last little while internationally? You know about what's going on over in Israel, and Gaza. You know that yesterday they had a number of hostages that were released as a result of a four-day truce. Uh, I believe that they have arranged that over four days they will release 50 hostages. Uh, and the, the price of that is that 150 prisoners that are right now in Israel's prison system will be released. So it's a three to one deal for four days. I don't know about you, but I am praising God for the release of innocent people on both sides. I am sure that there are people who are in prisons in Israel that uh, maybe their crimes didn't warrant exactly what they got. And I know that there are people that are being held by Palestinians right now that certainly did not deserve what they got. Uh, apparently there's a three-year-old girl that was just released and she celebrated her birthday while in captivity in Gaza. So let's, let's just celebrate with those families and be praying for people on both sides. You know, it, it's so easy for us to pick sides. But the reality is, is that there are hurting people on both sides and there are people who hurt on both sides. And we need to be praying for the peace of Jerusalem. And very honestly, I don't think we know what that should look like. God does, not us. I know how I think it should look, but, you know, uh, the old saying, you ask three people for their opinion, you get four answers. You know, that's basically the way it is. But with everything going on in our world right now, I've been praying in the last while saying, okay, God, you know, there was about a three-week period there where um, we had missionaries speaking and Pastor Colton was speaking. Lord, what do you want me to talk on? What do you want me to speak on as we're coming into the Christmas season? I did not expect him to say revelation. But that's where we're going this morning. I, I mentioned to Jeff this morning when I walked in that Sometimes I think Spanish is a, a more realistic language than English. You know, we, we call it the book of Revelation. They call it apocalypsis. So, you know, how many of you have ever read Revelation and thought, oh no. <laughs> First time I read Revelation, I went to my pastor and I said, what is this book about? Now, this was in a different denomination and he looked at me and he said, the book of Revelation can only be understood by pastors. No, that's stuff and nonsense. John wrote the book of Revelation. Jesus gave the book of Revelation for the purpose of encouragement. It's not meant to scare you. It's meant to bless you. It's meant to awaken you to the incredible bigness of our God, how vast and how large our God is, but also how incredible his plan is. So this morning, I want to try and set your imaginations on fire. I want you to imagine being in a dark room. There's no door that you can find, and only tiny pinpricks allow light in from time to time. You have no idea what's outside the room, but you know there's got to be something there. And over time, your eyes adjust a little bit to the dim light, and you begin to realize that there is life around you, animals moving people working, houses stand, lives go on, things happen. In fact, as, as time slowly goes onward, you begin to build a life in this dark and dreary area. You find a job, you get married, you have a family. And then as the normal progression of time takes place and you find that the moment of death is drawing close, you lie there, your mind goes wandering back to that time where you first entered that dark room that you now call home. And as memories awaken, you begin remembering that there was a, an awareness of something outside of the room. You remember the pinpricks of light that look so small and yet so inviting. And as you're lying there pondering, suddenly you hear a thunderous voice command you, come here! And with that, something or someone instantly takes you out of that room and into the space outside of that dark, confining place. You find yourself standing in a place with your eyes shut tight, and yet as tight as you squeeze them, light is streaming through. 
thinking that incredible light is going to be painful to behold. You keep your eyes tight shut. But a moment or two later, your curiosity gets the better of you. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You know, Tucker, don't look at the solar eclipse. Mm hmm. We know how that works. And so you slowly open one eye. And to your utter amazement, the light, millions of times brighter than the light that you are used to, doesn't hurt. But it seems to invite you in. You open your other eye and you stand there blinking as your eyes try to adjust. And as your eyes become accustomed to this new light level, you turn around to view this place that you are seeing. And in the far off distance, you see a, a dark speck. Somehow you know that's where you used to call home. Now it looks uninviting. It looks dark and cold. And the place that you're standing in, it's warm and inviting and bright. Somehow you know in the very depth of your being that this place is where you were made to live. Not that dark and distant speck. Exploring the place with your eyes, you, you, you begin to discern shapes and colors. And as you, as, as you look, things begin to come into focus. And you see before you a throne. Now, this is not a, a wood or a stone chair like you would see in that old place. No, this is a gigantic seat, a seat made from who knows what, and the one sitting on it fills it to capacity. One glimpse at the one sitting on the throne, and the throne itself is forgotten. The being is beyond description. He's appearing human in shape, but alternating between the hues of the rainbow and around the throne, or perhaps reflecting out from that one on the throne, is a rainbow of colors you've never seen before. Vibrating and pulsating, almost like living entities. For who knows how long you stand there staring at the throne and the one sitting on it. And then after what seems like an eternity, your eyes begin to realize that there are others that are seated around this throne. In fact, it's almost like in this new place, focus works inside to outside rather than outside to inside, like we're so used to. Here, reality begins at the throne, and it works outwards. And as you sit at the, stare at the throne, other seats become visible, 24 in all. These seats pale in comparison to the central throne, and yet they far outstrip anything that you've seen before. As you look at those other thrones, crashes of thunder and flashes of lightning crash out from that central throne, making your attention shift there again and again and again. And as you look again toward the great throne, you see lampstands come into view in front of the throne. And the floor of the throne is sitting a crystal sea. It reflects and it refracts the light emanating from the throne, causing the entire area to be bathed in a rainbow of pulsating color, making Colton's youth nights pale in comparison. <laughs> and as the colors bounce and swirl, you begin to realize that there's something sitting on the throne, on the floor. One, two, three, four living creatures sitting closer than the other thrones, and yet these beings are unlike anything you've ever seen before. They have more eyes than a spider. Each one has six wings. As you stand there wondering where you have ended up, the creatures suddenly bellow out together, and the words cause your knees to buckle, and you land with your knees on the ground. Kneeling there on the floor, you hear them cry out, Holy, holy. Holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and who is to come. And as you look at the throne, you notice that those who had been sitting on the other thrones around you were also on their knees, and their crowns are in their hands, and they're throwing them at the ruler who sits on the main throne. Talk about a sight. We, we can hardly comprehend a scene like that. It's too much input for our feeble little brains. But here's the reality, folks. If you could comprehend God with your three-pound brain, he wouldn't be God. He is bigger, vaster, stronger, more intelligent, more creative, more merciful, more just, more joyful than we could ever comprehend. 
because he is God. Now, I don't know about you, but while I was thinking about all of this, I had a hard time imagining anything beyond the features that I was describing at the moment. I could see the throne of God in those elders. I could see the crystal floor and the rainbows of light. I could see the four living creatures, but my mind seemed unable to focus beyond those things. What lies beyond? What lies beyond the perimeter of that scene? I, I, I couldn't tell you. In our day and age, there are few sermons actually preached on heaven. We like to talk more about what God wants to do here. But we're not made for here. This is not our home. We are merely travelers traveling through. I know that feeling because I'm here on a visa. This is not my home. It is my home, but it's not my home. It's a weird place to be. Kind of stuck between yes and no and maybe. And other people control the outcome. It's, it's a frightening reality, but it really does bring the whole idea of this is not your home into view. I had some pastors this last week that I was talking to, and they said, how do you like living with the whole, you know, visa situation? I said, I don't. But there is one benefit. Oh, and what's that? I said, I know my expiration date. Do you know yours? It was an awkward conversation. But the fact is, I know the date that I am allowed to stay in this country until, at least presently. We're working on that. But none of us know how long we're allowed to stay here. None of us are given a leeway on that. None of us are really given a, that's your exit date. Friends, there are many theologians in our world that try and tell you that heaven is non-physical. They may be well-meaning, but they're wrong. Many think that heaven is, is metaphorical for the good that we encounter in this life. They may be smart people, but they're wrong. Jesus spoke of heaven being a real place a physical place, an eternal place, and a promised place. Now, I don't want to try and tell you all about heaven today because that would take more time than even Pentecostals would be willing to let me talk. But what I do want to direct you to this morning are three important truths about heaven. So if you have your Bible, we're going to be reading Revelation chapter 4 this morning. The Apostle John is on the island of Patmos. He's been exiled there. He's an old man. Some people say that he could be as old as 90 years old at this point in time in his life. The Romans have attempted to kill him twice. They have boiled him in oil twice, and he survived. So he is kind of like KFC, except better. After this, I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had heard first speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and ruby, a rainbow that shone like an emerald and circled the throne. And surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders, they were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. And from the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. In front of the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Also in front of the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the center around the throne were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes. It's kind of a freaky thought, isn't it? In front and in back, the first living creature was like a lion, the second was like an ox, the third had a face like a man, the fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. And day and night they never stopped saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is 
and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and they worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and they cry out, you are worthy, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things and by your will they were created and have their being. Father, this morning, so many times we approach the book of Revelation with fear and trembling, Lord. We try and figure out what's coming and how to avoid it or what other people might go through or, oh my goodness, look at what the end of the, time, end of the world is going to be like. But Father, your word is very clear that there is a blessing to those who read this book. It's a book of encouragement. Help us this morning to see your heart in these pages, in these words. Teach us truths, God, that will not only uh, bring encouragement to us, but will transform our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Some people claim that heaven is not a real place. But I think that the truth is that heaven is the only real place. What we see here is merely a copy of the real thing, a model of what is waiting for us, an appetizer, if you will, meant to create anticipation for the real banquet. God told Moses that everything in the tabernacle was to be made exactly like God said. And the book of Hebrews tells us that earthly things are merely copies of those in heaven. C.S. Lewis once called this place the Shadowlands, and Paul said, for now we see in a mirror dimly. What I think both of these men were trying to say is that our world and all that we see are merely copies, three-dimensional copies in thousands of shades of gray. But heaven, heaven is the place where color will be added and dimension will be filled out. Maybe you've seen this video clip before. Thank you, Danny. I think much like that magical scene where we go from black and white to color, from silence to sound, is what the transition from earth to heaven is going to be like. It's going to be like opening a door and stepping out of a gray world into one of brilliant color. Heaven is the real place. And to that end, let me tell you that the first truth about heaven is this. The call to heaven is immediate. In verse 1 of chapter 4, we read that John the Apostle was in a physical place at a physical time and then heard an audible voice calling him to heaven. Now, people may argue about whether John was taken to heaven or just given a vision of heaven. It doesn't matter. What does matter is that God spoke and John obeyed instantly. Folks, I want you to understand, this command, this call to heaven, that's the rapture. People want to know where to find it in the book of Revelation? It's in one verse. Why is it only found in one verse? Because it's that fast. You don't write an entire book on a snap of your thumb. You write a book on what happened before or what happened afterwards. The rapture is that fast. It doesn't take more than one verse for John to go from here to there. 
We know that God will call his people to heaven. 1 Thessalonians 4.17 says, We who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Like John, we will hear thee come up here, and we will immediately find ourselves in heaven. The atheist would have you believe that at death, you simply cease to exist. But that's scientifically impossible. Dr. Isaac Asimov in the Smithsonian Institute Journal once said this. He said, energy can be transferred from one place to another or transformed from one form to another, but it can be neither created nor destroyed. We are composed of matter and energy, and while we can be transferred from earth to heaven, and while we can be transformed from this form to our heavenly form, scientifically you cannot simply cease to exist. Stephen saw heaven open before him before his spirit was taken there. And we know from Paul's words that to be absent from the body is to be at home with the Lord. Heaven is a real place. And whether it is the call of the rapture or the curtain of death, the call to heaven is immediate. There is no cessation. There is no nothingness. There is no limbo. There is no purgatory. There is not a Pasco, collect $200, and then move on to the next step. There is no perpetual reincarnation where you try and work your way up the ladder, but will be careful you don't say the wrong thing or you might end up as a snail. Mmm, escargot, yummy, yummy. There is no soul sleep where the spirit hibernates until God wakes us up. There is an immediate transformation and a transferal from this place and this form to that place and that form. My friend, if you are a Christian this morning, the moment you close your eyes in death, you will open your eyes in the life hereafter. If you are not a follower of Jesus Christ, that same experience will take place, but the destination will be different. Very much like what realtors say, it really does matter about location, location, location. The believer wakes up in heaven. The unbeliever wakes up in a place called Hades, a place that Jesus described as filled with conscious torment and regret. The call to heaven is immediate. The second truth about heaven is this. The creator of heaven is central. I always find it interesting to hear about the first memories or see the first pictures of a person's vacation. If the pictures are of people, then it's likely that you went somewhere to see someone. But if they are landscapes or, or objects, you went somewhere to see something. It matters, and it's different. You know, it, it, I went to Yellowstone, there are pictures of Yellowstone. I went up to Canada to see my kids, there are pictures of my kids. You know, I don't have a picture in, on my phone of my kid's backyard. Why? Because I could care less. <laughs> I went to see my kids. But when I was in Yellowstone, there aren't a lot of pictures of the tourists. Why? Because they are a nuisance. <laughs> They're stopping every 25 feet to look at a buffalo. But there's another one 25 feet down the road, and they stop again. Why? Because this one must be named Bill, while that one was named Stephen. And I want pictures of every buffalo that I can find. No, just get off the road, please. They're all hairy. They're all big. They all lumber. They're the same thing. Now, I, Mike... I'm not saying that your twins are exactly the same thing. I know you have pictures of one and you have pictures of the other, but most of the time you have pictures of both of them because even parents struggle to tell them apart. Verses 2 to 7 catch John's initial impression of heaven, and they give us an idea of what we will first see when we get to the place that he was visiting. How many of you have heard that song, I Can Only Imagine? You know, I don't know what I'll encounter when I get to heaven. Will I, will I see this? Will I see that? No, 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 no. When you first get to heaven, you're going to see the throne. You're going to see Jesus. He is the focal point of heaven. Everything revolves around him. And that's what we will see. There before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. That's the focal point of heaven. That is what we will see when we first get there. When you see the sign that says, you are now entering heaven, Jesus will be the, will be the first thing you see. 
It won't be family. It won't be friends. It won't be the finish line. It will be Jesus. The first images of heaven for John are are not a group of people welcoming him home. His first picture is not of the finish line and awaiting triumph. The first thing that John sees is the throne of God and God seated on it. After that, he begins to notice other inhabitants, but his attention is continually brought back to the throne. Imagine that. Just as our galaxy rotates around our sun, heaven revolves around the throne and the one on it. God is the center, the the hub, the core, the very nucleus, if you will, of heaven. And everything comes into focus as we focus on the center. That's amazing. Even though there are other things to be seen in heaven and in that throne room, John sees nothing else until first he focuses on the throne. Folks, our lives are meant to be lived this way. The more that we focus on the throne that we are running to, the more priorities come into proper focus. Nick and I were talking about this this morning, that the more time that we spend either in the word of God or in prayer, the more life seems to just line up right. But those times that we abandon reading the word or we abandon prayer or we abandon going to church and gathering with other believers, life seems to just go wonky. The more our priorities come into focus when Jesus is at the core. Dreams and goals come into proper alignment. Relationships come into proper being. In a very real way, much like what John is showing us here, God in heaven is the focus knob allowing our view of everything else to come into clear focus. If you've got things in your life that seem a little bit fuzzy, maybe you need to tune in on the throne just a little bit more. Now, why is that? It's that way because God is supposed to be our lens, the glass that we look at everything else through. And folks, the God who is supposed to be at the very center of our lives here is the very center of heaven and life there. In heaven, we stop seeing through a dim glass and everything comes into clear view. And with that clarity comes the simple reality that the creator of heaven is central. The third truth about heaven is this. The character of God is heaven. The final verses of this section are truly amazing ones. For the silence of John's first moments in heaven are suddenly broken by the sounds of heaven. What are the sounds of heaven like? (laughs) Worship. Tucker, you do a good job. Mike, you do a fantastic job, but nothing compared to heaven. Sorry, boys. Is heaven going to be a place where we just sit on clouds with harps and eat Philadelphia cream cheese? No, no. First off, I'm not convinced that Philadelphia cream cheese will be in heaven nasty stuff. But is heaven going to be filled with worship? Yes, it will. I love the way that God develops heaven for John, who happens to be his beloved disciple. First the throne and God sitting on it, then the elders and the living creatures, then thunder and lightning break the silence. And just when John must be wondering about this strange place that he's visiting, the group that he has seen breaks out into corporate worship. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. Cry the creatures. Now, one of them is like a lion. It's probably the first time, Ron, that you've ever heard a lion speak. One of them is like an eagle. Billy, it's a funny sounding bird. But the fact is, is that heaven is outside of our understanding. And then the elders all start crying out, you are worthy, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. I heard somebody a while back say, I I think heaven is going to be boring. My mother actually used to say that. Let me tell you this, it won't be. Heaven is a place of continual revelation. 
a place of ongoing amazement and a place where the terms like old hat, done that, and boring don't ever enter in. Heaven will be a place where your horizons are forever expanding. And part of that great expansion does include worship. Worship not pushed at you or thrown at you. Worship not because you should, but because you can't help yourself. Worship not of what you can't see, but worship of whom you can see. Worship will be as different there as heaven is different from earth. Here we worship out of, out of gratitude. There we worship as God's character is revealed to us. There we will come to understand that the character of God is not isolated from heaven. It's what makes heaven. Heaven is a place of holiness because that is who God is. Heaven is a place of love because that is who God is. Grace flows there from the throne, not to the throne. Mercy is the atmosphere because God fills the atmosphere there. God's character is not just part of heaven. It is heaven. We will live and bow and rise and work and worship in the tangible but ever-growing reality of God's character. That's what heaven is. Here you learn that God is holy. There you know holiness because God is there. Here you hold on to God's grace. There, God's grace holds you. Here you long for God's loving embrace. There you exist in God's loving embrace. God's love, his grace, his mercy, his constancy, his faithfulness, his eternal, eternality, his justice, his unlimited power are not part of the experience of heaven. They are the atmosphere and the environment of heaven. In perhaps a very real way, we go from living in a world where we sometimes feel God's heart to living in a world inside God's heart. Inside the very heart, the very character of God, because as John indicates, the character of God is heaven. Some people would try and tell you that heaven is not a real place. That is simply a man-made feel, that it's some, simply a man-made feel good, a myth, or at best, a metaphor. That cannot be true. Moses wrote about it. So did the prophets. Paul speaks of it, and so does John. Each of these men spoke of heaven as a real place, a tangible reality, a blessed place of rest, and as certainty for those who believe. But friends, the best and greatest proof for the reality of heaven is the life and teaching of Jesus Christ himself. Moses and Elijah came from heaven to be with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. Angels came from heaven to roll back the stone in front of Jesus' tomb. Jesus speaks of returning to a real place. And he said to the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, if Jesus is the way and the truth as we say he is, he would not be creating a myth for a dying man on a cross. If he really is the merciful Savior, then he wouldn't be telling a dying man a lie, would he? If Jesus really is the sinless one, then he could do nothing but tell the truth, because we all know lying is a sin. Therefore, if Jesus was telling the truth about salvation, then he must be telling the truth about heaven too, and he is. The call to heaven is immediate. The Bible tells us that Jesus Christ could return at any moment for his people. Right now in Iceland, they are waiting for a volcano to erupt. They have evacuated the city of Grindavik in Iceland because of the threat level. They are saying that this one could potentially stop air flights for up to three months. This could totally disrupt our world. The magma levels have risen up, and they say it could happen any moment of any day. They are living in anticipation. That is how we should be living. The Bible says that we could either be called to heaven or we could go to heaven at any moment. This isn't about escaping earth. It's about preparing for the eventual. 
a friend of mine in high school, I was talking to him about Jesus. And I was being a little pushy, honestly. I mean, I was a teenager. I was new in the faith. I was a little bit exuberant, and I'm already a little bit exuberant. And he finally, he kind of pushed me back because I was getting into his personal space a little bit too much. and Pushed me back, and he said, Sean, I heard what you just said. The answer is no. I'm not interested. And I went, What? Literally, he stood there. He pointed up to heaven. He said, God, listen to me right now. If you really are there and I don't think you are, the answer is no. I'm not interested. I want nothing to do with you. The next day, he died in a car accident. None of us are guaranteed it tomorrow. None of us. Everyone will face God. Have you made that conscious choice to follow him? To surrender your life to him? To ask him to forgive you for your sins? You want peace here and now? Then be ready for the there and then. The creator of heaven is central. Have you ever tried to ride a bike with a bent wheel? It just doesn't work. God is central in all of eternity, and maybe your wheel isn't spinning properly because you don't have God at the center. Everything works better and runs more smoothly here and there with God on the throne where he is meant to be. But if you're feeling like life kind of has these bumps, it's probably because you've shifted God a little bit in one direction off of his throne. The character of heaven is God. I grew up hearing that the party is in hell and boredom is in heaven. But that's exactly opposite of the truth. God is joy. God is creativity. God is belonging. God is celebration. You want to know what heaven will be like? Get to know God's character through the word of God and you will learn more about heaven than any movie could ever show you. Love will surround you. Grace will hold you up. Mercy will shine everywhere. Creativity will astound you. Forgiveness will awe you. Joy will overwhelm you and Jesus will be right there with you. You want to be celebrating forever? Then you have to come to God's house party and that's in heaven. This may be a more heady topic this morning, but folks, it will one day be the ultimate reality for every one of us. One out of every one dies. That's the ultimate statistic. Every one of us has an expiration date. Matter of fact, for all of us in this room right now, regardless of our age, you give us 100 years, We will all have a final number after the dash. All of us. 100 years is not long. Heaven is getting ready for you right now. Are you getting ready for heaven right now? Life here is gray tones. Heaven is vibrant color. Life here is boredom. How many of you have ever heard from your kids, I'm bored. How many of you ever said to your parents, I'm bored? I don't know about you, but my parents generally responded with, (laughs) then I'll give you something to do. Heaven is adventure and excitement. You want to be where there will be no regrets? Oh, there's the big one. I'm not even going to ask for a show of hands here, but how many of you have regrets? How many of us walk through life with memories of if-onlys and what-ifs? But if you want to live in a place where there are no regrets, no what-ifs, no if-onlys, that's heaven. Hell is the ultimate what-if. If only. Jesus is your ticket. Heaven is the place you want to go. That's what heaven is like. And that's why Revelation is a book of encouragement. Let's pray. Father, open the eyes of your saints. Open the eyes of your people. 
Help us, Lord, to not only see the truth, but to know the truth. Help us to hear your word and understand that it applies to our hearts and lives today. God, help us to be ready for that moment that you call us home, whether it's the rapture or it's <laughs> the homecoming. Lord, I've heard that there's a, a teacher in the high school. She's 24, I think it is. She may have cancer. Not that long ago, we were praying for a little boy who had cancer and he was under the age of 10. God, none of us are guaranteed a certain amount of years. One of the pastors in our town had a stroke this last week. God, none of us are guaranteed a tomorrow. But we are guaranteed that we will stand before you in heaven. We will have to give an account for our lives. So help us to be ready for that day. As we go into this Christmas season, Father of Celebration, help us to take a good hard look into that manger to remember who it is that's there. It's not just a cute little baby. It's the very center of heaven. Come down to hopefully become the very center of our lives. We give you praise this morning in Jesus' name. Before everybody opens their eyes, I'm just going to make an opportunity. I never want to take it for granted that just because people come to church, they've given their lives to Christ. So if you're here this morning and maybe you've never made that decision, and you're feeling the heartstrings just being tugged on by God this morning, if that's you and you know that you are not ready to go to heaven, you're not ready to go home, Please get ready. Please. I mean, if, if I could beg you, I would. Get your heart ready for heaven. And if that's you this morning and you just need to make sure, I want you to just slip your hand up so I can pray for you. I see that hand. Lord, your word talks about fitting us for heaven. Prepare us for there, just as you are preparing a place there for us. Lord, I pray that you help us to do our own evaluations and just line our lives up with what your word says, to be doers of the word and not just hearers only. Help us to judge ourselves properly so that we are not judged. And help us, Lord, to try and reflect the character of heaven the character of Jesus Christ as much as we can here because there are so many that need to know. And we thank you, Lord, for those like Robbie this morning that have stepped up and said, I'm going to follow Jesus. We give you praise for that in his mighty name. Amen. Mike, you're going to close us with a song this morning? Fantastic. Michael, close us up. God bless you. Have a fantastic week.